Well, uh, you've heard some of the rubbish on that first record. Well, if you would like to just uh, fasten your seatbelt or whatever, you can have a bit of the rubbish. Oh, this is the second one. This, oh, there's one thing I've got here. This bit of looks like clothesline. It is actually, it's detonating cord. Detonates four miles a second. As you can see, it's just like it, yes. Just the job for the mother-in-law's Christmas present. <laughs> Get a 50 yard of that and that's it. <laughs> no, that's the one that's room that hangs upside down in the wardrobe at midnight eating white mice. You know, it's me for the monster. Well, this is it. This is the stuff for them. They, uh, with this method of this explosive, I, I'm going to show you, uh, I have written off one or two of the stately homes of England. After the thieves have pinched the lead off the top and they've taken the oak panelling out, I go into the downstairs rooms and we put this around the walls with a gobbishite on the back of it, you see, all in the downstairs rooms and the last end, of course, we leave on the stairs, just as a touch of melodrama. <laughs> <laughs> then you take a piece of the blue sump fuse in the detonator and just tape it to it, you light the fuse and then you go out of the building. That is a must, of course. <laughs> Fuse burns down, the cord tech detonates four, four mile a second, blows the bottom out and the top drops down like a pack of cards. But on this um, fuse business here, on this bit of blue sump, when we put the detonator on, at one time, I, you've noticed I've taken it off here, but at one instance, I had the station hotel at Stafford, the bloody round table boys. And I got the detonator on, and it was summertime, and they got a large German ornamental silver fireplace you know those big fire holes you can get half a tree trunk on and there was no fire in in the summer and someone said hey basically while you're here what about making a bang <laughs> well, these little detonators you know they were good like a 12 bore shotgun so we wrapped it up in the evening sentinel and stuck it in the fire hole and they just drew back a bit we lit the fuse and waited and there was quite a bloody bang and a shower of confetti flew out the fire hole and everybody went hooray and then they suddenly stopped uh because there was ominous rumblings from up the flue. <laughs> and down the flue, come under weight and half a soot. <laughs> it hit the grate, percolated across the broad loom carpet, and the first three tables were wearing black socks. <laughs> and just then, the manager come in. Ouch! The bloody lot of you! And take that idiot with you. <laughs> and they have their meetings in the swan now. <laughs> they reckon the grub was no good there anyway. That, that's their story and that's what they stick it to. <laughs> on another instance, we put one on and shoved it in a crisp bin in the Grand Hotel at Hanley. I don't know, we must have been mad. And we flopped it in there and stuffed it down the end of the room, set it off, bang! And the Italian waiter ran in with his hands up. Yeah. <laughs> And the voice at the back says, be kind to your web-footed friend. <laughs> you get all sorts of things like that. Another time I was telling them about this stuff and I was just explaining to you how we put this on and write these buildings off and it was an architect's do. That was in the pottery. So one of these chaps said to me, well, Mr. Bates, could you blow up a place like this? I said, aye. And by the look of it, it wouldn't take so bloody much either. <laughs> and he was the poor son that designed it. <laughs> it didn't make his night. No, no. <laughs> like the other Sunday, I knocked these coaling hoppers down in Birkenhead Locomotive Yard. I don't know whether you read about it in the Liverpool Post. Did you see that? You see that bloody great building going down? And one daft bugger said at the back, hey, what about the poor bugger in the top flat? <laughs> <laughs> it's not even a flower, I tell you. Oh Aye. The, uh, on occasions, though, as you can imagine, I get called upon to talk to some weird groups. I didn't know there were so many secret societies in Great Britain. <laughs> Have you ever been to an English-speaking union? I went there and a shower of Chinese turned up. <laughs> I've seen a Cypriot in the morning suit. How <laughs> about that? <laughs> oh, dear me. <laughs> that was to go to a point to point meeting. They, um... <laughs> they had to... I remember my Mrs. answering the phone, my secretary acting unpaid, the one with the four kids. And uh, she would answer the phone one night, the phone had gone, and uh, it's usually when you're tearing a piece of paper off a roll. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Yeah. And she's, 
there at the bottom of the stairs, laughing like a drain. I said, what's that? She said, well, you remember, you've got to go to the Church Women's Guild tonight. At 8 o'clock, they said they just rung up. They said, would you tell Mr. Bates not to come until quarter past as we have a little prayer first? <laughs> I said, I don't bloody need one if you're going. <laughs> the weird lockdown in San Max, where we live. And uh, another time, I, uh, I got this phone. Will you come and give a talk to the Winslow and Alderley Edge Ladies' Luncheon Club? I thought, good God, lads, you're after your depth here. <laughs> it isn't for you. <laughs> You see, because Cheshire is like a teapot. And we live in the swamps down at Sandman. <laughs> it's like being in the bayou, you know. They call it Salt Lake City. <laughs> We've even had those Mormons come round, knocked on the front door. My miss, they still these big black robes on. Have you ever seen them? Now that my missus went to the door, I said, I said, we're Mormons. She said, we don't want any, we've got one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got one. And I said, there's more on, you know. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> Cheeky with it too, you know. They go about four doors up and knock there, and the lady comes out and she said, We're Mormons. She looked at him, said, Are you that religious sect that have a number of wives? We are. You should be bloody well hung. We are. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh... <laughs> No, uh, no, he's getting off the tail. Uh, it wasn't tell these silly stories, really. They, um, no, they, I'm talking about the Winslow and all the age ladies' luncheon club, you see, and I thought, well, God, God, you're out of your depth here, lad. You'll have to watch it. Deny yourself. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought, well, I'd better go, you know, you don't like saying no. I thought, but uh, I remember a cousin of mine was a doctor at Winslow at the time, and he made a special journey. Oh, yes, we haven't seen that branch of the family for some years. <laughs> but he heard it was going. So he came. I said, hello, how are you? He said, well, just two things, really, I've come about. He said, I hear you're going to give a talk to the ladies, Windlow. I said, yes. He said, oh, well, a couple of things. He said, you don't know me. You're no bloody relation of mine, you know. <laughs> yeah. And got back in his sticky little moped and went back. Anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I went to give a talk to the ladies, you see. Got in this place and 5,000 quid's worth of hats walked in. <laughs> oh, the lot. Some had got the cherry over one ear, some had got the banana rampant, you know. <laughs> <laughs> On the hat, I mean. You know. oh, filthy, mighty lot of swine. They, uh, they got there. And uh, as they all came in there, oh, you know, and it's overpowering, you see. And I started me ramblings. I'd only been rambling a quarter of an hour and a dozen had gone home, you know. <laughs> I knew what they think, you see, because the Carruthers don't laugh because the Fortescue Smythes weren't, you know. Yeah. That wants some saying at this time of the night, and all. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh dear, I thought, oh, what's going on? Until the old girl next to me, like she was the chair lady or whatever you call it, she leant over to me, she said, Take no bloody notice of them, Batesy. Give them some stick. Aye. <laughs> and I bet, I, be, I bet she was pushing 80 this one. And she was really enjoying it, you know. Anyway, this lot went on, and uh, I rambled again, and another 25% went on. We were left with a few. But about four months after, I'm blowing some tree roots up in a bloke's back garden near Wimslow. You know, he's having this, the two levels, Japanese style, I think it is. I don't know, some of that. But he couldn't get the tree roots out anyway. And I was thrutching away in his back garden. There was nobody in. He'd gone to business in Manchester, you know. And boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden, a voice across the lane. There's another big house across the lane, you see, with the heavy stone gate pillars, with the gargoyles sitting on the top, <laughs> spitting and sneering at the peasantry going past, you know. <laughs> and a voice said, Is that you, Mr. Bates? And I peeped through his heavy laurel, you know. I said, it is, madam. She stood there resplendent in her shantung and cashmere. <laughs> and, uh, oh, uh, would you like a cup of tea? I said, I would, you know. Well, I can be a little devil when I try. <laughs> so I went through his laurel, and you notice it never goes back in the same place again. Does it? <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> I said, you won't remember me, will you, Mr. Bates? I said, I can't recollect, you know. <laughs> well, I was at the Windsor and all the ladies' luncheon club when you came along to give us a talk. 
then she looked very fugitively up and down the road. She said, and I was one of those who stayed. <laughs> <laughs> Little devil, you see. Oh. Well, I say, you can come in and have a cup of tea, but for God's sake, don't let anybody see me speaking to you. <laughs> I think the best laugh is, though, is when you go on these bloody television things. You have some bloody laugh with them, you know. Oh, you get some weird buggers there. Oh, you do. <laughs> I went in that bloody Gazette programme. Somebody said, you know, Jackie's here, Jackie. Is that bloody Jackie Collins, you know, John Collins' sister? I said, who's he driving for this week? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> it, it was bloody eight week for me. Then <laughs> <laughs> we had some silly twat from BBC too. Rango, oh, would you come down and BBC two on Saturday? I said, I can't, I'm going to a donkey derby. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bloody vague, and it was quickly covered, clearly. I was performing on my motorbike, you know, the ladder of death and all that bloody rubbish. <laughs> and the wall of fire for the kids. Somebody said, hey, mate, should you bring your motorbike? We're running a donkey derby, we've got to get some money, quick. <laughs> I said, why? He said, some silly twat forgot to put the water tank in the roof of the pavilion. <laughs> 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 so we've got to raise about 500 quid immediately. <laughs> Has there been no cricket this bloody season? I said, oh. Oh, I said, all right then. Oh, uh, anyway, did you bring your motorbike and do a few stunts, you see? Shoot the balloons and try and kill the bobby, you know? <laughs> and all this bloody life. So I said, all right. So he said, and we're having a donkey derby, and this silly bugger rung up from London. Can you imagine it? He's sitting in St. Martin Square. I can just imagine this bugger in one of these here upholstered chairs, you know how they are. <laughs> with his chucker boots on and his Savile Row suit. Oh, we wondered if we'd come down and BBC Two on Saturday. I said, I can't come on Saturday. I said, I've got to go to a donkey derby. And there was a silence. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth is a donkey derby? Well, here's me sitting there in my bloody shirt tail on the bottom of our stairs trying to to explain to this bugger in London what a donkey derby is. I said, well, they run donkeys round the field. I said, they have to have a horseshoe-shaped course because the little buggers won't go past the place. <laughs> won't go past the place they started from. <laughs> have you ever tried it? <laughs> this twat had never been out of Greater London. He doesn't know what sort of sports us peasants indulge in. <laughs> You know, and they think we're around the bloody twisters that way, you know. So, I said, but I'm, I'm very... I, I said, anyway, I said, I, I'm taking my motorbike. Oh, that made it worse. <laughs> well, what do you want to do a motorcycle a donkey derby for? You know? I said, never mind. I said, I can't come on Saturday, you know. <laughs> oh, very well, you know, click. I thought, that's the last we've heard of bloody Shepherd's Bush 8000 or whatever it was. A Sloan, some or other. Anyway... By God, I went to the donkey. I mean, the following Monday, he was on again. Oh, we've been considering. They better consider this. About high-level bloody talks about this. <laughs> we wondered if you'd come this Saturday. I said, I, I said, oh, I said, but hold your foot up a bit. I said, how much am I getting? <laughs> <laughs> then we might look bloody daft, you know. <laughs> oh well, we give you twenty guineas. Guineas. Well, they give me that when I went on. Bloody Gazette at Granada. When I got to jump in my car and go up to bloody Didsbury or Manchester, <laughs> eh? I said, oh no, I said, I can get that from the Splinter Group in Manchester. <laughs> oh, bloody hell! Oh, he didn't like that, no, no! Oh, bloody hell, he was falling out with me then. <laughs> oh, I see, oh, I see, he said, yes. I said, oh, yes. Uh, uh, he said, well, we'll give you reasonable expenses. I said, well, I've got to get a bloody A ride to get to Crew Station. I said, then it cost me about seven quid on the train. I said, it's a long way. I said, where is your place? It's Hammersmith Studios. I said, well, Christ, that's an awful long way from here. You know, I said, it must cost me seven pounds on the train to get to London. He said, but well, surely that's first class. I said, well, I said, I'd well, like to travel in style down again, you know. <laughs> well, silly bugger sort of thing. Oh, well, very well, we, we won't argue. We'll give you another ten guineas. We'll make it thirty guineas. <laughs> And you meet Mr. Liam Nolan in the in in the pub across the road. It's bloody dangerous, that. In the pub <laughs> across <laughs> across the road from the studios at half past one. I said, "All right, I'll be there." So 
the wrong Arnold Buckley opens today, Arnold, you fancy a bit of telly on Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> he said, hi, where are we going? <laughs> I said, we go to London, we go in your bloody car. <laughs> <laughs> Sickening, isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> we pedals off down there. We're there at quarter to twelve and get in the pub. Ooh, we had a touch of the bloody delicious tremblings, a bit of the load. <laughs> well, come one o'clock, you know, the place is in bloody uproar. These cockneys were trying to take the piss out of us. <laughs> Peasants, you know. <laughs> we were doing it to them quietly, you know. We were having a laugh between us, you know. Hey, anyway. Well, it didn't come until quarter to two. By that time, we were re it was really a rollicking good do going on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can see him now, and he comes through the door, and he bloody face fell out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, he just say, oh, we were just on frigging in the rigging. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You're not Mr. Bates, I said, I am. <laughs> How did you guess? <laughs> <laughs> Don't have any more. He's, I said, get off, lad. You go have a bloody drink with us. I said, I'm not bloody coming in. <laughs> we had to get one, though. Anyway, he got us in the studio, Christ. We went in the studio. And as we get in there, Al Buckley, hey, hey, look at this, mate. Look at this bloody lad. That's what's that, Harold? And this is dressing room door, blaster mates, and Al Koran. You know. The... <laughs> this bugger starts apologising. I said, what? He said, I'm very sorry, Mr. I said, what, 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 what's the matter, lad? He said, well, he said, uh, I hope you don't mind sharing the dressing room. I said, sharing the dressing room? I don't want a bloody dressing room, I'm dressed! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we had a look around, see? So he said, now, will you sit there, like at a table like this, like you were in there, I sat here, and nobody was sat there, though. You know, more or less, you sit there and behave your bloody self, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, these bloody lights start coming on, they bring this group on, they twanging and making a bloody row. <laughs> Wasn't making much notice of them. And then there's another table up about where that wall is there, and this Peter Ray comes, and he sits down with this James Mason, you know, the film man. And a bloody cat under his arm, you know, a bloody <laughs> louse-ridden bloody animal. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like he got the bloody man, you know. <laughs> If it had been up here, I'd have bloody shot it. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> talking about with this moth-eating cat. We have some weird ideas down there, don't they? <laughs> Anyhow, it wouldn't have made a bloody good pie. You know? <laughs> so uh, he was. Hi, <laughs> Peter. He was chatting, and then this lady that trained those animals for a film they made called Incredible Journey or something. Or that she trained two dogs and a bloody cat. She's about the only book, then he sends amongst them. <laughs> anyway, he was talking to them, just then Gay Byrne comes and sits by, like, well, I was sitting there, and Gay Byrne comes and sits there, and he said, how do you like being in London? I said, well, not much different, but the sandbags town hall's a bit bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't suppose you get the complaints we get up <laughs> So we were just talking like this, took my notice, like, and we were only just chatting. Anyway, just then he said, uh, he said by the way, he said, and he tone changed because I was too pissed to bother about this. <laughs> <laughs> said, we've just seen you knock down one of these huge chimney stacks on the monitor. He said, how do you get them to drop in such a confined space? I thought he'd been very formal because I took my notice. I, didn't, yeah. I said, well, instead I've got a touch like a bloody midwife. <laughs> <laughs> we were on the air then. <laughs> and this was just to make me feel at home before, but I was too much at home. <laughs> And it was a live show. And 330,000 bloody people knew that Batesy had got a touch like a bloody <laughs> <laughs> And not only that, Adel Buckley, who was in the wings, could see it, and the manager said, you come up lovely, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then the phone, he said, if you'd have seen that bloody... Him that's just backed up with him, what's your name? He said, he was glued, and his nose... <laughs> on the bloody glass panel, <laughs> but it was too late, <laughs> and then the phone started going, who's the new male nurse you've got in the studio, <laughs> 200 phone calls in the course of an hour, everybody wanted to know where he was working, you know, who was in with the touch like, <laughs> bloody scream it was. 
long way. He said, he come to me after. He said, well, we we'll give you 17 minutes. You were supposed to only to have 10. <laughs> he said, but he said, I'll tell you this. One more crack like that. He said, my finger was on that bloody button. And you'd have been off and no 30 guineas. <laughs> <laughs> wow, bloody amazing. Mm. <laughs> I mean, any questions now? <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, was, that was the job. <laughs> I did a bit, I did a wide, did a bit of a road winding job for a fair bit of Fragium. I knock it in this bloody rock, you know, when you go through Fragium by that swing bridge. And uh, there was a 45 degree bass rock, and I blew that up for a firm. Oh, I remember some because the Wesleyan Chapel was across the road. He said, Don't upset them, buggers. That's <laughs> 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 so that was all out, you know. <laughs> so uh, I've got to be very careful and want to knock a slate off. And uh, I think it was the anniversary the following week, you know, you know, upset them. Anyway, they. Uh, <laughs> It's all right for you bloody laughing. <laughs> but they, um... <coughs> I was blowing this uh, rock, I tell you. Anyway, the director of this firm came. They always get bloody greedy, don't they? <laughs> when you've got five minutes, go over to Appleton. It's bloody Warrington. From Frodium to five minutes. You see? He said, and we've hit this rock, this sandstone. You see, it gets over there. Oh, bloody great field it is. Oh, it must have been about 15 acres, 20 acres. And there they are, they all dotted over this field, these blokes down these trenches about this deep, having a bit of a bloody chop and whatnot with these picks and a bit of a shovel. No. So I saw the foreman, I said, uh, he sent me to come and blow the rock. Where is it? Oh, we've got them in these, he said, it's outcropping in these little trenches, you know. Oh, so he said, there's some in that one there. You say, well, this bloke had been chopping and hacking and buggering around and looking at it and having a bloody smoke up and it'd go away, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh, it's a bugger had pinch it, you see. <laughs> anyway, put a bit on, you know, bang, and reduced it to sandstone. We only had to shovel the sand out, the sandstone. Lovely. So, look, I've got a bit in my trench. So we go up there and we've got a bit there. Bang, shovel the sand out. Well, Come about half past eleven, they've thrown the bloody picks away. No more thick wrists for us, you know, <laughs> thumping. This bloody idiot will blow anything up, you know. <laughs> Bloke can have a bit about as big as that bloody bag. <laughs> I've got a bit in mine, you know, bang. Shovel a two shovel of the bloody sand out, you think. About quarter to twelve block said, I've got a bit of rock for you. I said, oh, all right, so I've got me bag of gubbins and me shovel. And we walked up, walked across the road into Appleton Cemetery. I said, I thought, well, it's not far off bloody dinner time. I said, haven't they got an effluent on the job, you know, to get in? I said, are they brewing up in here? He said, no, he said, I don't work for that firm. I said, who are you? He said, I'm the grave digger. <laughs> he said, and the last eight graves have been a proper bugger, he says. I've hit this sandstone, you know, it had gone through the graveyard at the top end. Of course, poor old lad, you know, was about 60 odd, and he wasn't too energetic. Anyway, he said, uh, I said, well, what's to do? He said, he's got to be down at three o'clock. I said, has he now? He said, aye. He said, well, what I've been doing before, I've been chopping these graves out, backfilling them with the loose, and when somebody died, he shoveled the loose out and down with them. Of course, I've had about a fortnight to get one out. He said, but he said, I think there's there's been a lot of them go all at once. <laughs> you know, been a bit of an epidemic or something, you know. So, he said, and they've over got me a bit. A bit? Bloody hell, I said, let's have a look at it. He was down about this far. He'd only got the turf off the top. He was on solid bloody rock. I thought, here's one bugger. They'll have to build up Western style. <laughs> 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 With a few azaleas or whatever. They are. <laughs> I said, how do you want him? You no, know, I meant, you know, keep it level. Some of that. Anything to get away with it. A silly old bugger said to me. I said, he said he wanted two foot ten across the shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> and one foot nine at the... He wanted the shape of the bloody box. I said, you'll have it bloody oblong and that's all you'll get. You know. You'll have it three foot wide and buggy, you know. Well, I start thumping this, but he's got to be down at three o'clock. Well, I've got to work like a bloody idiot all through dinner. Had no bloody tea, no cup of tea, and now. And about two o'clock, I was down about five foot, and I was peeping over the edge, and I thought, Christ, I'm down here before my time anyway. <laughs> Some bugger puts his head over the fence. Now then, Batesy, don't wake the others up. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if 
we'd have had a bloody union and they got on strike, I'll tell you. Anyway, we got him down, they come and load him down. I thought, my God, he'll keep down there, bloody shall he drop. <laughs> but uh, I remember, you know, they're crafty lot of buggy. The bigger the firm, you know, they say the bigger the what's it at the top. They, um, <laughs> <laughs> they, they had a great bit of fun, though. Wine in the A5 in a, a certain county, which of course has to remain nameless, but I was working for a big firm, and then one of the directors of this firm goes, Hey, BC, there's 17 trees, they've got to go. He says, We can't dig them up. All alongside of the road here, right alongside the A5, because the A5 got to be widened. There were 17, those great big witch elms, huge trees, and they were like maybe one here, and then one 20 yards, and then there may be four in a row, and then another one about another 40 yards. For, they stretch for about Oh, over a quarter of a mile, all the way along. Seventeen of them. I said, he said, but the, the, the county surveyor says, no blasting. I said, well, what the hell do you want me here for, then? He said, well, we want you to blow them up. I said, now, who's lumbering who with what? <laughs> he said, well, I'll tell you what we do. I take him to lunch. <laughs> you see? He said, now, that doesn't give you much time. <laughs> When we come back, he had his two or three brandies in his cigar. He said, when we come back, I want the lot out. He said, then we argue about it. <laughs> it's one way. I said, all right. So they went about, oh, about quarter to twelve. Well, we had the gang of blokes. I said, are you ready? Stand by your shovels. <laughs> They're already muffled shovels, of course. Who <laughs> <laughs> knows? a lot of cocking all your life. Anyway, muffled shovels like a load of pirates, you know. Ready? Dig! They're out of sight, you see. And everybody had his own tree. And they got stuck in like a load of moles, going under these trees like hell. She said, well, I could run along and put the explosive under. See, if I'd got to do them and blow holes underneath them, he'd have hurt me and we'd never got the damn job done. Anyway, we had all the explosive in in about half an hour, three quarters of an hour, and they were lunch, you see. So I said to the former, now, you get up the other side, give us about 100 and odd yards from the entry with a big red flag in the middle of the road. Don't let anybody come down the A5, no matter what. So he took two blocks. I'm down at this end, and I use a single-shot exploder on the end of my cortex, an electric detonator, instead of the bit of fuse, you see. So I could stand in the middle of the road with the red flag under my arm, like this. <laughs> With me exploder in me hot, sticky little hand. But I've only got to twist it, and the detonator goes off, and the lot are up. You see? And I was standing there, like, and I heard a bit of a rumbling behind me, and one of these big lorries, associated lead, came up with a big chromium bumper bar, and he stuck that on me sciatic nerve. <laughs> and put his face round. What's going on? What are you doing? Stopping the road. I'm in a bloody hurry. You see? A bit late to get up to the cafe for his lunch. I said, just half a moment, I twisted this exploder. And 17 trees took off. <laughs> straight in front of him. Yoom! <laughs> well, it's an awe-inspiring sight when you're ready for it. <laughs> when you're looking along the road and there's 17 bloody big trees, all of a sudden, the lot leap in the air. You don't know whether you want to shave or haircut. <laughs> I have never seen a pair of eyes like it. <laughs> it's shut out like chapel at pegs, you know. <laughs> what the bloody hell was that, he said. I said, there you are, that would have scratched your paint, wouldn't it? <laughs> the next time, beware. <laughs> oh, God, I... Talking about covering with muck, I did a job for a, uh, Mr. M and a Mr. S. They must remain anonymous. <laughs> They'll probably get shot. And they said, can you blow the colliery up? One of these old... Collieries, you know, the lot's got to go, the head sticks, the winding houses and the chimney stack and all this. And the ground's got to be given back in a fit and proper condition. Can you imagine it? Oh, boy. Anyway, they said uh, they'd got a chase side, a wheelbarrow and half a dozen blokes. It's nothing like optimism. <laughs> we're, going, we're going to destroy the colliery, you know, flat there. Oh, boy. They're more like an Irish comedy team. Anyway. <laughs> Can you do anything for us? It looks like I've got to do a lot for you, doesn't it? I thought I'd better grind it up pretty small. They haven't got much to sh shift it with. Anyway, we got stuck into it on the Monday. And there was concrete flying about. And I was shifting these buildings one time. By Wednesday, I'd shifted quite a few. 
and they've got one little office there, the only one with the phone in, with big white letters on Tuesday night, not to be blown up. <laughs> You're going mad, you know. <laughs> Wednesday morning, I went to a lot of trouble. Drilled the chimney, got all the explosive in. I was just looking around, and then the, the Mr. S of the partners came, and he's in this little office, and he's at the door. Hey, come here! Come here! He said, so I went over. Uh, he said, uh, I said, I'm going to write the chimney off. He said, ah, I thought you were. He said, just have a word with our insurance man. He's on the phone from Sheffield. <laughs> so I picked the phone up. I said, hello. Oh, this is Hardcastle, Prude and Hardcastle or something like that. <laughs> you know, insurers. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, oh, about the chimney. He said, our man will come tomorrow. You'll be able to knock it down probably a week on Thursday. <laughs> so this bugger's joking, all right. What do you want me to do? Take all the explosive out? They never mentioned this. I said, just half a mo, put it down. I just put it at the side of the phone. I said, uh, just stop there a minute. When you Mr. S like so went out and just touched this off. Boom! <laughs> I went back in and said, did you hear that? He said, aye, what was it? I said, chimney just fell down. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was dead in bloody not. Yes, yes, oh I high winds, you see. He was, <laughs> plain bloody hell he was. Anyway, that was only the start of me trouble. So, on the Thursday, I, got, I thought, well, I'll have it written off be weekend. Well, Friday morning, I'd only got one big winding house to do, and it's Staffordshire blue brick, you know, five courses thick. And I've blown the concrete engine bed inside, so I'll drop the building on it, and then they can shovel it up. Because I haven't got to do the washing plant, because it's on steel legs, you know, with these washing plants, and about two-storey high, you know, with the, where they used to wash the coal. So he said, don't blow that up. We'll burn, do that with the burners, you see, then it keeps, the, you don't twist the metal. So I thought, well, this is a damn big building. Well, it took me, ooh, about a couple of hours, drill all the holes around it, you know. I thought, I'll give it a right thrutch and down, and uh, I'm finished. And it's just about getting on for lunchtime, it was, I'd done it. A bit of sleep blowing across, and one of these Austin Cambridges come down and stopped. And the bloke got out, and it was Mr. M. Got his Gannex coat on, his best suit. Heavy, knitted, yellow woolen gloves. Don't think his eater was working in the car, you know. <laughs> Come across, you say. How are you, Mr. Bates? I said, very well, Mr. M. I said, you get a good view. I'm just going to write that one up. 25 foot high. Oh, bugger you, he said. I've heard about you this week. And he goes away somewhere. So I said, watch out for the bits. Boom! You know, and the bloody great building fell down, you see. And then the dust is slowly going away, and these blokes are sneaking back. Hey, look there, look at that. There, on the second floor fire escape landing, of the washing plant stood Mr. M. <laughs> now, he'd gone in there to get a good view. <laughs> They'd been washing coal in there since 1894. <laughs> this was the nearest building we'd blown up to it. And then on the second floor, all the cross members joined to hold the roof up. They're that deep in, like, black talcum powder. <laughs> and boom, and it shook the steel legs. And there must have been half a ton dropped on the phone. He goes, poof, and he was straight out on the landing. And somebody said, Al Jolson. <laughs> Head to foot. And as he come down, knocking himself, the whites of his eyes shone as though they'd been blankoed, you know. And those big yellow knitted gloves, like eight hands boxing gloves. <laughs> And he opened his hands at the bottom and somebody shouted, Mammy! <laughs> <laughs> I finished up 30 quid light on that job, <laughs> yeah! <laughs> uh, I don't know whether you've ever been at home in the evening and you've had these peculiar telephone calls. But I got one Thursday night. Come up to the estate as we have a very important person coming, no names mentioned, but he plays polo. <laughs> you see, now this is the agent on one of the large estates, and he suppose he thinks you're that bloody thick, you're not supposed to know what he means, you see. <laughs> He's trying to do a touch of the MI5. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'd better go. This was on the Monday morning. So I went up to the estate, and when I got there, you drive into the estate, into the estate yard, to the estate office, then knock on the door. And the voice, it's always the same, come! <laughs> <laughs> you never get come in, it's always, come! <laughs> so you go in, oh, that's the way the eyes say. 
go inside, and when you're inside there, it's an oval table. Don't kid yourself, it's not a bloody round one. And it's oval. And the agent's sitting there in one of these chairs, a chair somewhat like this here, but with two-inch blocks of wood under the legs. So he's sitting well over the table. Now, the sub-agent, or his understrapper, as we call him, <laughs> sits on a similar chair, but with no blocks of wood. <laughs> sits a little lower, you see. The bloke that's bashing the typewriter at the bottom end on the, on the sharp radius has two inches cut off his bloody leg. <laughs> that's to keep his nose well down to the ribbon. I have never seen the poor bugger that brews the tea. <laughs> He is obviously sitting in another room, cross-legged, on a cushion with a piece of string tied to his big toe. Like, you know, and he gets the message. Painful, too. Brew up. <laughs> and anyway, I said, what is it, gentlemen? What's it? What do you want blowing up? You know, in my oafish sort of way. Oh, it's the large chestnut tree in front of the private chapel. It has to go. I said, oh, um, Stafford will show you where it is. That's the head forester. He's outside with his two henchmen, you know, with the smocks on and the turned-up shoes and <laughs> the little Robin Hood hats, you know. <laughs> Foresters, you say. <laughs> <laughs> but this particular morning, the hats were off and they were looking very pensive. So I went outside. I said, what's up, fellas? Oh, we'll show you where it is. Follow us down. So they pile into the Land Rover and we go off down, down this drive and we come to the private chapel and here this damn big chestnut tree. It's a beautiful thing in full leaf. I said, that isn't it. Oh, yes, it's got to go. I said, why? Well, the very important person that was coming was taking residence in the hall and overlooking the polo paddocks and looking across, he should have had a good view of the private chapel from his bedroom window but it was obscured by this huge tree. Now, the gentry are different than us peasants. If you get a new motor or a new rifle or shotgun or whatever, something you're proud of, you say to your mate, what do you think about this? And he said, oh, why, I think it's grand, that. But the gentry don't. They have to wait for the other person to see it first. And when the other person's seen it, he remarks about it. And they say, oh, do come along and have a look. But if he can't bloody well see it, he's not going to remark about it, is he? <laughs> so to make absolutely sure he saw it, it had got to go. <laughs> but there were just a couple of snags here. The windows in this private chapel were reputed to be, and are, uh, priceless. They were taken out when the war was on in case there was a bomb drop 60 mile away. <laughs> I got to blow a tree up within 25 yards. No wonder the forests were looking pensive because they said, don't crack a window. If you do, all our heads will roll. <laughs> you see, you can imagine it, you see, because I'm back in me buggy and away back into the swamps. But they've got to live there. And they'd get the blame, you see, because they're rent-free, light-free, coal-free, so many eggs, so much milk get the toenails cut and a cup of senna on a Friday night. <laughs> they looked at They don't get any money, but they're happy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're happy. <laughs> you see, it might have upset the routine, you see, because somebody's going to give them a leather in if they fuck up. <laughs> I said, all right, chaps, I'll be careful. So I had to quietly thrush it, you know, a bit at a time, you know. <laughs> Thunk and it sagged. Thunk and it sagged again. I'm frigging about with it for about an hour and a half. It would take me about a quarter of an hour to write them off, you know. Boom, and it slowly fell over. And they laid about it with their matchets, you know. And it was pit pitiful to see the bloody looks on their faces, you know. I thought, right. So I got in my motor and I went back up the drive. I thought, I'll just call in the estate office and let them know it's all over. <laughs> I got up there and, come, <laughs> went back in, there they sat, you know. I said, it's all over, gentlemen. I said, by the way, there's a few windows fell out the old chapel, does it matter? Oh, God. <laughs> no, no, they were like this. I said, I'm only joking. Yeah. Like Queen Victoria, they were not amused. <laughs> I waited three and a half months for eight pun ten. <laughs>
Allez, ouais. <rire> Thank <laughs> you.